Hello, Watch Enthusiasts. Now, very often I'm asked what my thoughts are on the concept of the Holy Trinity, which is to say the, the, um, the brands Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe and Vacheron Constantin, who are really the most illustrious, um, or at least seen and perceived to be the most illustrious of Swiss brands in the watch world. And I, I'm often asked what my thoughts are about uh, putting them in their own category of, um, of their, their uh, really extremely high reputation and, and, of course, their prestige among brands. But uh, I didn't think I really wanted to make a video on this subject because I feel that it's a very uh, it's a very personal choice uh, which brands you think are the most illustrious and interesting. But rather, today I'd like to talk about three brands which I think have um, advanced watchmaking in a way that hasn't been seen before and that have impressed me to form my holy trinity. Before I go on, though, I would like to encourage you all to join me on on the Watch Guys, which is my group on Snubs, and this is, has become really my my most major form of social media. And, and I really would encourage you to join in order to com communicate and, and discuss matters of horology with other collectors of myself alike, and also um, uh, c discuss your collections, post pictures of your collections, and indeed allow me to answer questions or, or any video requests that you happen to have. Now the first brand I'd like to talk about is Breguet, and this is a brand which I have the most immense admiration for, founded in 1775 by a Frenchman. Um, and indeed, that's probably the reason why uh, most people wouldn't consider the, this uh, this brand to be a brand that fits into the holy trinity of, of uh, watchmakers. Um, but uh, of course, this uh, video isn't based on brand prestige, but rather on the, the amount this brand has given to the watch industry. And the first noteworthy innovation that Breguet brought into the world um, in, uh, in 1801 was the tourbillon. And of course, the tourbillon is a manner of uh, having a, uh, a watch where... Uh, effectively, uh, at that time, accuracy was improved immensely by having the, the tourbillon, which counteracts the effects of gravity on a watch, um, and is, uh, even to this day, an extremely difficult uh, piece to make, or at least is, um, is perceived as such in the industry, and as a result, these command immensely high prices by, uh, by collectors, and indeed by brands when they produce them. Uh, and it is impressive that in, at such an early period, 1801, um, Breguet was able to come up with an innovation that effectively has remained admittedly advanced upon, but in terms of its its original concept has remained unchanged over the years. And of course the original version um, is, isn't as ornate as the more modern um, versions and, and indeed uh, more modern iterations of this, but this really was the start of an innovation which truly has shaped the watch industry in a way uh, which other innovations, um, other than perhaps the, uh, the, the, the lever escapement, which is probably the, the most important innovation in the history of watchmaking, or at least in my opinion, um, but apart from that, I do feel the tourbillon in the world of luxury um, uh, wristwatches is uh, effectively an innovation that has, uh, has changed the way people look at a luxury timepiece. Now, the second innovation of Breguet's, which came in 1812, is that he effectively invented the wristwatch. And this came about um, as, uh, of course, this wasn't the first men's wristwatch. That, that was invented by Gérard Perregaux in the 1880s for the, uh, the, the, um, the German Navy. But, in fact, this watch uh, was designed specifically for the Queen of Naples when, uh, when of course, Italy was uh, broken into city-states before it was unified. Um, but, of course, effectively, this was, this was the first timepiece of its, of its type because though previous wristwatches had been seen from uh, the likes of um, uh, the, the watches, for, for instance, made for Queen Elizabeth I, these watches were effectively uh, clock mechanisms or pocket watch mechanisms placed onto uh, effectively a metal solid bracelet, like a sort of a, bra a bangle, if you will. And this doesn't really constitute what one, one would uh, commonly call today the wristwatch, with a, a watch head and then a strap or bracelet. And this was effectively a, um, uh, an egg-shaped wristwatch um, designed specifically to be worn and to be comfortably worn on the wrist using uh, effectively a cloth strap. And so through this, Breguet did effectively invent the wristwatch, um, which must be said to be effectively the, the greatest invention when it comes to effectively uh, what we're enthusiastic about um, ever to be produced. Now similarly, uh, Breguet's son in 1830 invented what effectively became the watch crown, effectively a small uh, mechanism of adjusting the time on a watch without using a, um, a, 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 a effectively a key or, or other device of that nature effectively an integrated manner of adjusting the time and indeed winding the watch. And of course this did uh, effectively signal a, a change in, in watchmaking and indeed pocket watchmaking towards a world where a watch was effectively an all-inclusive piece um, and doesn't include uh, uh, effectively a key to, to operate it. It can be operated entirely under its own steam, if you will, and using only components attached which effectively paved the way for a wristwatch because it would be extremely difficult to make a watch that uh, sat on the wrist um, that would be capable of resisting the, the damage um, 
uh, incurred, I suppose, as a result of um, uh, of anything uh, getting onto the watch, a uh, watch that isn't protected by a pocket, as previously seen, without an integrated um, uh, integrated crown. Of course, these are all very good reasons uh, why Breguet sits in my list of, of one of the most uh, illustrious brands in terms of creations, simply because I do feel that they produced uh, truly incredible pieces in terms of um, innovations throughout the generations. And this clearly hasn't been lost, because of course in 2012, um, they released something that they invented in the early parts of the century, which was effectively magnetic pivots on uh, various uh, bearings inside their watches. And this is something that was previously effectively seen as um, as really witchcraft, putting a, a magnetic field inside a watch, because of course that was seen as something that uh, um, that was really the um, uh, the very death of um, of accurate timekeeping. But of course, with the introduction of of silicon springs, Breguet was able to, uh, to capitalise on this and effectively use magnetism to their advantage inside a wristwatch. Of course, the beauty of this uh, the, this concept of supporting various bearings magnetically effectively is that friction is reduced immensely, and of course friction is the main cause for watches running at a particular beat rate, and also for service intervals. And of course, previous to this um, this concept, running a watch at 72,000 beats per, um, uh, or rather semi-oscillations per hour, um, or effectively 10 hertz, and I appreciate I've been um, uh, told that, 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 that 10 hertz is not equal to 72,000 um, beats per hour, but of course these are semi-oscillations, so there are twice as many. Um, which is why it does actually equate to 10 hertz if one thinks about it that way. And of course why it's advertised as such on their classic chronometry uh, 7277 line, which is one of my favourites, in fact, from the brand. Um, but of course this allows the brand to run their watch at unbelievably high beat rates, which would previously have seen uh, been seen as twice the um, uh, as twice the rate of a high beat watch, um, which is really unimaginably fast in terms of um, um, oscillations on the balance wheel. And this is a very interesting way of producing a watch with an extremely smooth second hand and a very accurate watch with little uh, or rather less wear. Now the second uh, brand on this on this list for the sake of technical innovation is Omega. And this may strike many as, uh, as a rather curious um, sort of choice, I suppose, because I suppose many would see Rolex with their, their oyster case as really uh, giving an incredible amount to the, the watch world. But the reason why I selected Omega was because uh, Rolex didn't in fact invent the waterproof case, they certainly developed on it, but they didn't invent it, that was invented in the mid-1850s actually, um, on various pocket watches. But Omega, I feel, have released various things, and indeed um, have featured many things, such as the Daniels Coaxial Escapement, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also um, one other innovation with regards to the Omega Ploprof, and it's one particular piece of technology inside this timepiece which I feel has advanced dive watches really forever and is used by a great many brands now for producing the ultra water resistant extreme dive watches. Now this innovation is no longer seen in fact in uh, the Omega lineup but I feel really did uh, advance watchmaking in terms of dive watches. Because of course the major problem with dive watches is that even if you produce them with a monoblock case, so that's to say no case back, so one drops the, the components of the watch in through the front, this, there is still the, the room for water ingress through the front of the watch, or indeed when one reaches the, the greater depths um, reached by the dive watches in the 1970s, one has the problem of the crystals of watches simply collapsing into the watch under pressure. And what Omega did was they effectively surrounded the, the dial and, uh, and indeed the movement with a ring, um, in their case uh, plastic or rubber, which was compressed uh, by the pressure and as a result prevented the crystal from collapsing in onto the watch. And of course there was still bending in the crystal, but this allowed uh, more, more recent watches like for example the Rolex Deep Sea or indeed the Rolex Deep Sea Challenge, um, which uh, reached uh, incredible depths at the bottom of the Challenger Deep, to withstand this pressure by transferring the, the pressure um, exerted effectively on the front crystal through to the case back of the watch, which itself was having a, a great deal of pressure exerted upon by uh, surrounding water. So one does have this very interesting uh, effect. Um, which Omega pioneered here, and there, there really was no watch which did the same. Of course, the, the Omega Seamaster 1000 also featured this technology, but I do find it incredible that, uh, that Omega came up with this, um, because it did result in these watches being uh, approximately 100 times more, uh, more airtight than indeed the Apollo Space Capsule, which is something that I always find incredible, um, and is a fact which uh, I must say I, I find very interesting um, with regards to Omega's um, te technological advances, not just as a, a watchmaker, but also as, as really a, a technological innovator as a whole. Of course, this sparked a real change in the way dive watches were made, because previously uh, a deep sea dive watch had to be bigger and thicker than previous uh, models. And though the Ploprof was an extremely large watch, it wasn't uh, due to this size that it was water resistant. 
and of course watches like the original um, uh, Rolex um, uh, Challenge, um, which was made uh, effectively for the original dive of the, the Bathyscaphe Trieste to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, was an immense timepiece with a, a, a um, effectively a semi um, a semi sphere for the, the the crystal. Whereas I feel this is a much more elegant way of doing so and making a watch which. Despite the fact that it was uh, it was made um, for a, a, a suitable depth, I feel for most divers of that era of 600 meters, these watches uh, were still watertight at well over 1300. Simply that the crystals arced down and stopped the hands at this depth. Otherwise, the, these watches would have continued on um, in terms of um, uh, pressure rating if they didn't use these acrylic crystals and used a more modern style of sapphire, for instance. Now, the second reason why I feel that Omega deserve a list on uh, a place on this list rather is due to their, their use of the coaxial escapement. And this is a really brilliant piece of engineering designed by the very famous uh, English watchmaker George Daniels. And it replaces the previous styles of escapement, which are, well, though extremely um, uh, popular in terms of being used in the vast majority of wristwatches, these d are, d are prone to wear because of the, the fact there is a great deal of um, horizontal friction on the parts, which does mean that over time they wear down and, and they require a great deal of lubrication to work correctly. However, where the, the Daniels escapement is so impressive is that through you, the, the use of three different palettes, um, instead of the, the, the conventional um, setup that one would normally have, effectively one's able to really remove friction from the equation. And, of course, this results in, in these parts not needing to be lubricated at all, and does extend their service life, and also uh, prevents the, the change in accuracy that would, um, uh, would occur as a result of a uh, change in friction and the wearing, uh, wearing down of parts on the escapement of a watch. I do feel that the most interesting aspect of this, this escapement is, of course, that though the technology here is, is tremendous and, and is very, very clever in terms of separating the impulse um, in the escapement from the, the locking function, and so as a result reduces the, the friction immensely, but it's also the fact that this is the first time a fully mechanical escapement has been redesigned and marketed on a, on a, on a large scale, as has been seen with the vast majority of Omega watches that aren't quartz these days, um, being fitted with these escapements. So I really do feel that Omega are, are fairly unique, um, or, or rather actually are unique in, in the watch industry with regards to producing a, a, a watch with, with a, a part that's normally so integral to a mechanical movement that's been redesigned so extensively and then been marketed successfully to the mass market. Now the final brand I'd like to talk about as the, the third member of my, my watch holy trinity, I suppose, is Grand Seiko. And this, I suspect, will probably spark quite a bit of debate and um, discussion on the simple uh, fact that, that uh, this is a brand which isn't, it isn't at all from Europe, um, let alone Switzerland, um, which is, I think, an interesting and somewhat spiky subject for people buying a luxury watch. But I personally feel that Grand Seiko, through the fact that they don't have any real stigma around producing quartz timepieces um, and very, very high-grade quartz timepieces, have I think been able to make the next logical step from the mechanical movement onwards to a more accurate future. Um, and of course I still love traditional mechanical movements, but I do feel the one innovation of theirs really has pushed the edge of the envelope. This is of course the spring drive. And this is a, a really rather remarkable innovation from Seiko, um, or rather Grand Seiko in this case, who I really do feel produced the, the logical uh, progression from a traditional escapement onwards. And of course, the coaxial escapement is a wonderful invention and really, the, I think, a, an incredible solution to this as far as being entirely mechanical. But I do feel that what Seiko did with regards to spring drive really did, uh, did, did move things forwards in terms of accuracy. Now, though these movements were, were announced in 1997 and actually shown in 1998 and then released in their Credor line um, in the early 2000s, they were actually invented as early as 1977 and then actually uh, fully patented in 1982. But this is rather interesting, and they did leave rather a large gap, but I suppose the, the market at the time was very much intent on, on quartz watches being the future, so I suppose there wasn't really any, um, any purpose for it until later on when mechanical watches started to become more and more interesting. And this is a, a really fascinating manner of converting the, the uh, potential energy in spring through to electrical energy to power the hands uh, via the use of electromagnetic um, uh, forces um, on what they called the glide wheel. Of course, when one thinks about it, it's a very, very clever concept to transfer this energy in the spring via the use of an electromagnetic brake um, on what they call the glide wheel, rather than a traditional escapement, um, into electrical energy which uh, powers a quartz oscillator, which then allows the hands to be powered um, and, and indeed turned without any sort of, um, uh, sort of twitching that one, one would normally see from a, 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 an oscillating escapement, because of course this turns only in one direction um, and has a, a constant... Um, uh, effectively a constant impulse on the hands which allows them to turn completely smoothly. 
but also the, the byproduct of this is that you're able to make a watch which is accurate to within uh, single digits of seconds within the month, which is completely impossible, really, with regards to a, a normal mechanical movement, especially in a watch where it's always going to be subject to varying magnetic fields. And even in watches that are anti-magnetic, it'll be um, subject to movement and different angles, which, though they won't damage the watch, especially in a, a, shock, a shock-resistant watch, they will affect the timekeeping minutely. Therefore, with the innovation put into, and indeed the creation of the spring drive, Grand Seiko and Seiko as a whole really does deserve a place in, in this, uh, uh, this holy trinity of, um, of most um, innovative and uh, an important brands in terms of adding more to the world of watches in terms of innovation. Um, and I certainly think it's difficult to argue with this, as, as, um, as, as really the spring drive is something that, never, that was never really seen before. ETA tried to make a movement that worked similarly in the mid-90s, um, but ended up uh, giving up the, the, the concept. Um, so as a result, Seiko are the only brand that currently still makes a form of this, and, and to great success as well with regards to having an accurate watch that is truly accurate to quartz levels with the beauty and craftsmanship of a mechanical movement. Anyway, do please leave your comments down below as to what you thought of my, uh, my choices um, with regards to this, uh, this subject. And also, please do give, you, give me your thoughts, and also do leave your comments and thoughts on, on my Snups group, which uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll enjoy reading and find rather interesting. So, thank you very much for watching, and uh, please do like, share, and subscribe if you did enjoy the video, and would like to see more content here in future. So, thank you very much for watching. This is Arm on the Watch Guy, over and out.